as Paul Smith says in his book, what Hemingway did is he took the Indian camp next to Walloon Lake and he transported it to the Upper Peninsula. And that's why in the Upper Peninsula, none of the Indians are recognizable and none of the Indians speak English. Well, that's interesting. You mean, to, it's, I, you mean it's all fiction? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually going to go and find, um, after that discussion a couple weeks ago, I sent my uh, boyfriend a note and said, hey, we need to go camping at the, that lake. And Chris Struble told me about a really nice campground right across US 2 that's right on Lake Michigan that you can have like beachside campsite. So we're going to try and do that sometime this summer. Sounds good. Oh, you like? Okay. Yeah. All right. Why not? So um, I'm gonna have I'm gonna yeah. mute everybody for a few minutes, and, and then Peter, you're gonna have to unmute yourself. Um, and we will get started. Just a reminder that this is being recorded, and it is hopefully syncing still. Facebook Live. If not, it's going to be. Um, so that everybody can watch this at a later time if they would like. So if you don't want to be uh, recorded or online, you might want to take off your camera view and uh, simply have a, a background or a, a static photo or something along those lines. So um, this is uh, our discussion for section three, the war section. And uh, Peter Hayes, um, a author and professor emeritus of English at the University of California in Davis, California, uh, has served on the Hemingway Society and Foundation Board and has authored six books on Hemingway as well as many other articles. And he is going to uh, step in this evening and moderate uh, this section. And uh, Peter, I'll let you uh, take it away. Okay, so we're talking about the Nick Adams stories, and um, like those uh, baseball statistics that uh, have an asterisk after some players' names because of uh, some anomalies, there has to be an asterisk after Nick Adams' names. Uh, we have a tendency to talk about Nick as one continuous character. And I've done that myself in print. But one of the stories uh, on today's reading list is chapter six from In Our Time, Nick Sat Against the Wall, where it plainly says he was shot in the spine. And yet a few stories later in In Our Time, we see him cross country skiing and then still later in, in our time, he's uh, hiking in uh, North Upper Peninsula, uh, past Saint, uh, Sini, um, along uh, what again Hem Hemingway transposed into the landscape as the Big Two Hearted River. So, shot in the spine means certainly in 1918 or 1917, uh, uh, paraplegic, and yet Nick continues to walk. And in fact, in subsequent stories, uh, if we regard uh, in another country as a Nick Adams story, although he's not named as such, um, his wound is to his leg, to his knee. Um, so, as I say, there has to be an asterisk. Uh, Nick is not, at least in this one instance in chapter six, there is not a coherent progression for Nick Adams. All right, that being said, uh, I want to skip to um, in another country. Um, Let me ask uh, anybody in the audience here, um, why are they healing Nick in the hospital? Why are they giving him physical therapy? Sure. 
surely somebody not just has. open to anybody <laughs> okay yeah. um because he has a wounded leg that's been immobilized and all his muscle has atrophied and they're trying to build it back up for what purpose think. oh what? well um to send him back to the front because exactly. he's not driving an ambulance he's soldiering exactly. which is really weird <laughs> So the, the, the impetus is not simply charitable to make Nick whole, to make him well for his own sake, but he's a cog in the military machine and they want to return him back to the machine because soldiers are expensive. Uh, Hemingway was born in the Victorian era. Queen Victoria was still alive when he was born. He grew up initially with a horse and buggy. And in Now I Lay Me, we see Dr. Adams coming back from a hunting trip with a horse and buggy. Yet, uh, 18 years later, when Hemingway went to Italy, the world had become mechanized. There were tanks, there were machine guns, there were airplanes dropping bombs. There was poison gas. And so we now talk of the military machine. And yeah, Nick is a part of it. He's been damaged and they're repairing him so he can go back to war. So the same machine that injured him, the war, in a subsequent portion of the factory is now repairing him so he can go back to the war. And so that whole story talks about uh, the mechanism of war in the early 20th century. And of course, now we've digitized it. By the way, anybody know where the title comes from? Don't see any hands up. It's from T.S. Eliot. Actually, it's from uh, Marlowe, Christopher Marlowe's The Jew of Malta, which uh, T.S. Eliot used as an epigraph for his poem, Portrait of a Lady. So um, Hemingway is very subtly showing his erudition uh, without Eliot's footnotes. Uh, it's there if you want to pick up on them. So, all right, um, I've said my little piece. Uh, let me answer your questions. We do have a question, um, Peter, uh, from Patrick Garrett in the chat. Did Hemingway mm -hmm. just use Nick Adams as a vehicle to write a thought that he wanted to write about and never intended to connect the story? I think there is obviously some connection. The Nick in Now I Lay Me does depend to a certain extent on what we've already seen in The Doctor and the Doctor's Wife. Uh, and it looks forward to fathers and sons. Uh, Nick's uh, view in fathers and sons of his father having been caught in a trap um, well, we've seen that trap in these two earlier stories. So, no, I think I think uh, Hemingway did uh, did want some continuity. I think the outlier is uh, the early Nick sat against the wall, um, and then he was stuck with it. Pete, can I ask you, since you, you spoke about now I lay me, can I ask you a question that is a real question of mine? I do not have an answer myself. Sure. How do you connect, Pete, the two, the two parts of that story? That is, the, uh, the opening with um, Nick being unable to sleep and fishing streams and doing prayers and thinking of former girlfriends. How do you connect that to the second part of the story where you have this conversation with his orderly John. I cannot make sense of that for me, and I'm hoping that you can. 
All right. Well, first of all, um, there's a disconnect between the title of the story and the first paragraph. The title of the story comes from the prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul will keep. But in the first paragraph of the story, Nick is saying he's afraid to go to sleep because he doesn't want the Lord to take his soul. And he's doing his best to stay alive. Uh, all right, so the, as, a, as, a, as an aside here, there's a metafictional question also. Uh, the stream he describes fishing is extraordinarily like Big Two-Hearted River, which raises the uh, question of, did he actually fish Big Two-Hearted River, or did he just make it up while he was lying in a, uh, on the floor of a hut in, in Italy? All right, end of digression. He thinks back to his earliest memory. Um, the question I would throw back at you, Don, is uh, my earliest memories are of people, not of an attic. And I have to wonder why Nick's earliest memory of the house in which he grew up in is of an attic. But accepting that it is, the item in that attic is his parents' wedding cake. And I think that leads us into the discussion with John about uh, John's marriage in Chicago and the whole discussion of uh, marriage would cure what ails uh, Nick. And of course, Nick's saying, so far I have never married because having seen his parents' marriage, it is not something that he wants for himself. Thank you. Uh, okay. Julie, you had your hand up a minute ago. Did you have another question? Oh, unmute yourself. Yes, I, I did have a question. Um, I'm curious as to another, another question, something that I've, I've been reading some things I'd forgotten all about. And, uh, and that's a long list. Um, and I have not found yet among, you know, the gazillion Hemingway articles. Um, I haven't found an article or, you know, a book chapter that questions whether, what kind of orderly John is. Because the, I keep coming across articles that that say, you know, John is a hot, or they imply that John is a hospital orderly who has been assigned mm -hmm. to the tenant, but he's no. not, he's a Batman. Yes, he is. Yeah. He's, so, he's exactly that. So is there, I never read the story as being in a hospital. I thought it was just in a house on, you know, on the field where they were billeted. Um, I agree. But I keep coming across places where they say it's a hospital, and I'm just wondering if I've been misreading it all these years. No, I, I don't think you have. I mean, they're seven kilometers behind the lines. Uh, that's no place for a hospital particularly not when there are planes bombing the lines. No, it wouldn't be a hospital. They're lying on straw, not hospital beds. And- uh, Well, and it, it could be an aid station, but it doesn't say anything about him being wounded. And you know how when Nick is hurt, we hear how he's hurt every time. Like we get yes. the news on what's the matter with him and it doesn't say that either one of them are hurt. No. Uh, I, I think they're just, uh, it's a, they're just off the line. They're resting in a hut seven kilometers behind the line. Um, and as you said, the, the British slang, yes, he's a Batman. He's his orderly. He's his assistant. Um, there's a lovely scene in um, the Hotchner scripted movie Adventures of a Young Man uh, built 
on the Hemingway short stories uh, with Ricardo Montalban and Richard Beimer. And um, Beimer is uh, volunteering to serve to drive ambulances in Italy. And Montalbaum is uh, complaining that he's got to pull a soldier out of the front lines to serve as his orderly to translate for him because he doesn't understand Italian. And Nick in the story says his Italian isn't that good. Mm -hmm. So whether that's the reason or whether it was typical in the Italian army for officers to have orderlies, I do not know. But no, he is not a, in my estimation, he is not a hospital orderly. Um, it sounds like from, from the reading I've been doing this week that it, it was still common at that time, even though it was really a holdover from the, the cavalry days when you needed someone to carry all your gear as an officer. Um, but but the, they were still using them in the Italian army. Um, but there's a mention in the story that they assigned John to him because John had lived in Chicago and he knew English. And so I'm guessing right. the translator aspect is important. Yes. All right. Any other questions? Um, I know, Don, you had sent me a question in email um, about a very short story and thoughts on why that may have been excluded from the Nick Adams stories. Oh, you're muted, Don. <laughs> I see from the chat that Cheryl Evans in, has asked the same question. She asked, why is uh, a very short story not considered? And so I would ask Pete that question. I mean, we know that the, that the uh, agenda we're following here in Wall and Wall and Lake Reads is the agenda that, that Philip Young has established. But all of you should know that that agenda has been, has been challenged by, by a number of people um, and so, and one of the ways it's been challenged is uh, the, the chronology. There are a number of people who think, who believe, who are convinced that the stories that, uh, that uh, Young adds later, namely um, a, uh, the end of something and, uh, and the three day blow come earlier, that these are pre-war and not post-war yeah. stories. But here's the question I would like to ask Pete. Uh, and it's about a very short story. It, as you know, in, in the volume in our time, the story of value short story comes immediately after the vignette that begins Nick sat against the wall. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because um, the vignette with the Nick sat against the wall is the only vignette that, that mentions Nick. And then in the very next story, the he who was wounded in a Nick sat against the wall, shot in the spine, Pete, as you said, is in a hospital in Padua being treated for something that involves his legs because he walks around, he, he walks around in crutches. And the other reason to suggest, and I've argued this in, a, in an essay in the Hemingway Review, the other reason to consider uh, a very short story as a Nick Adams story is it's so autobiographical. In, in, in the published version, the, the woman, the nurse, that, that the, the wounded soldier falls in love with is called Luz, L-U-Z, which means light, okay? Mm -hmm. But in the manuscripts, in the manuscripts of that story, Luz is called Ag, who is the name of Agnes von Karowski that we know from every, every biographical study we, we've read was the woman that Hemingway, the nurse that Hemingway literally fell in love with, expected to marry, came home to the United States, expecting her to come, and then received in March of the next year that Dear John letter telling him that this was only a boy and girl affair. So Pete, Pete Hayes, my friend, my question for you is, do you consider a very short story a Nick Adams story? And if not, why not? <sighs> We're back to the asterisk. Um, 
in the 1924 edition of In Our Time. She is Ag, and the hospital is Milan. And when he revised it for the 1925, he changed it from Ag to Louis and Milan to Padua. Um, I think because it is so autobiographical, um, I think for that very reason, he would not want it to be too closely identified with him. And uh, if if there is a reason, I mean, again, um, Nick is not so named in, in another country. Uh, Young has included it. I have no problem with that. Uh, if he wanted to include uh, a very short story, all right, but I think Hemingway uh, simply did not want to uh, have it that closely identified with him, which is why when it was published in 1925, he changed the names. And uh, if he could have, he probably would have changed Nick's name as well for that very same reason. Wonderful. I'm glad we got two answers or two people's answers out of one question. All right. Oh, right there. Uh, any other uh, comments or questions um, about any of the five stories in this section? I hate to call on people. <laughs> Use your best classroom technique. Yes. All right. Jolie is going to get the uh, gold star for the class today. All Don't right. forget to unmute yourself. There we go. I, I won't because I'm that student who keeps talking. Um, but I'm going to ask this question and then I will manage to keep my mouth shut for a little while. Although having you guys where I can actually ask you instead of reading the limping hero and going, gosh, I wish I could ask Peter Hayes such and such. It's like it really is seriously too tempting. Um, anyway, what what do you think about the silkworms? Because I've read articles that talk about the worms as, you know, the classic Shakespearean devouring the dead people worms, but right. these are more. silkworms and they're, you know, it was a home cottage industry at that point in Italy still. And, um, and something that I didn't know about silkworms that I have recently learned is that in addition to making silk, it's also how they made leaders, uh, like oh. fishing leaders. They would they would actually cut open and and you can watch it on YouTube if you want to. Everything's on YouTube. <laughs> they cut open the worm when it's about to make its cocoon, and it's basically it's got like tons and tons of silk goo inside it, ready to be made into a cocoon, and they stretch it, and and stretch it out and that's what they used you can still buy it it's this it's the silkworm leaders all of those leaders that and i just think that's not something that i knew because i never fished with silk worm innards but no. it's all they had then and nick would have known that anybody would have known that because if you if you go and find an antique box of, of fishing leaders i mean it says what they're made out of and so he would have known that. And I just, I wonder if, if maybe the worms chewing are not quite as bleak as I once thought, because they're silkworms eating and they're, you know, they're not the worms devouring the dead. Anyway, just curious on your take on that. Well, I, I always read it the first way you interpreted it as a memento mori. Uh, and in uh, Indian camp, uh, Dr. Hemingway sews up the Indian woman with gut leaders, not silkworm leaders. Um, and several times Hemingway talks about gut leaders. So if he ever fished uh, with silk leaders, um, 
I don't know about it. Uh, I've never read anywhere in his writings about a silk leader. Have you? Um, I, whoops. Oh, I, I'm not muted. Sorry. I, I'm getting confused over whether I've muted myself or not. Um, I haven't read anywhere that it talked about the silk leaders, but on packages where they sold them for anglers, Mm -hmm. um they're not called silk they're called gut leaders because that's what oh. it is it's the the inside of the worm there's two big gut sacks that they open and then stretch so so, so there's, yeah i assumed they were something like cat gut you know yeah. but, um but i was apparently mistaken about that not having done a lot of trout fishing in 1910 um well, there's a whole new right. avenue of uh, research for uh, somebody to investigate. Uh, did Hemingway use silk leaders? Um, as I, I said, I've, so. I've always <laughs> interpreted it as a, a, a memento mori. And if pressed in that particular story, first of all, um, Hemingway, uh, while he was at Chio in the uh, uh, Italian Alps, for one night lived in a hut where there were silkworms. So this is based on one night's memory. And if you want to draw it further into that story, um, wow. Uh, Don, here's another connection. Uh, how about silk wedding dresses? draw it from that opening paragraph all the way to the discussion of marriage or uh, at least some uh, some ornament on the wedding dress. Uh, they could also be used probably in shrouds. So lots of things from silk. I'll ask our resident fly fisherman here in Walloon Lake who who played uh, Hemingway in George Colburn's young Hemingway film, see what he knows about. The Good, situation. please do. I'll see what he has anything uh, to say. Um, Joan has asked in the chat, uh, she found it interesting that Nick was given two pieces of advice in this particular section of the book. In Now I Lay Me, John tells him he must marry but the major in another country told him that he must not marry. However, the major had just lost his beloved wife and was devastated, but she found it interesting that, um, that there were two stories contradicting marriage, both within the same section. So if there was any yes. on that. Uh, by the way, uh, as we emerge, hopefully from this pandemic, the major's wife died of, uh, pneumonia in 1918, probably from the Spanish flu. Uh, remember, she'd only been sick a few days, and therefore, uh, what probably got her was indeed the Spanish flu. It's also interesting that on the day she dies, the major is at the hospital taking physical therapy. He's, that's when he breaks into that argument with the narrator and says, you know, uh, my wife has just died. Uh, I, I cannot accept it. And then he's gone for three days setting up the funeral. But the day she dies, he comes to the hospital. He has lost everything. He's lost his identity as a fencer. He's lost his identity as an active combatant. Now he's lost his wife. He's got only two things to provide order in his life. One is the regular schedule of coming to the hospital, which he does every single day, even the day of his wife's death even though he has no faith whatsoever in the machines. Again, getting back to my uh, metaphor about uh, modern machinery, he's a beta tester. 
They're all beta testers testing these machines for the first time. And the other thing he has confidence in is grammar, the unchanging rules of grammar. It's a good thing he didn't live in these days of descriptive uh, linguistics as opposed to prescriptive. But in his day, grammar was something you could hang on to. And he does, and he insists that Nick does also, uh, as something that will um, betray him less. And I don't mean in a sexual sense, but betray him in the sense of mortality of a woman, as his wife has. Um, there was another, uh, just uh, Jolie's pointing out that uh, regarding the marriage advice on two different contradictory uh, statements, that of course the the they are both from men without women as well. Yeah. Well, no, the, the one. Well, all right. John is temporarily without a woman, but he is married and he has three three daughters. The major is without a woman because his wife has just died. Um, their advice is uh, contradictory because the major has just suffered the loss of his wife and it's a terrible blow. And having lost that aspect of his identity being married, uh, he wants to prevent Nick from suffering the same fate. In John's case, He's very content in his marriage. Um, and so, yes, get married. It'll solve all your problems. Nick, of course, thinking back to his parents' marriage, uh, denies that. Uh, Joan has a question. Yellow house. Okay, yellow house. Um, it's usually figured as a house of death. And... Um, the boat uh, next to it is uh, Sharon's boat ferrying the uh, living to 80s. Uh, and I've seen conflicting um, reports in various accounts of the uh, Piava River, whether in fact there was or was not a yellow house uh, at uh, Fasalta. But in any case, in his dream, or rather in his nightmare, uh, he sees that house and feels drawn to it. And it's usually, as I say, it's usually interpreted as the house of death uh, that he's being drawn to. Uh, Kathleen had um, did a little searching for us regarding okay. silk. Uh, did a Google search and found a book entitled The Search for Courage. It says, quote, his parents began dropping reminders that it was time to begin ma making plans. In Italy, he had a dream of the trout streams of northern Michigan and out presenting his fly or worm on the end of the silk leader coming alive as the rod did. Wow. All right. Bob. So there is that reference to, to silk. Silk, all right. And again, you know, going back to writing what he knows, and if he if he's resourceful to know certain things are useful in different capacities, it would be something he would feel comfortable blending into different parts of a story. Yeah, yeah that's I. Thank you, Lily, and uh, uh, I learned something today. And even Catherine Palmer, who will, Catherine be, too. will be moderating our final uh, session in two weeks, looked up silkworms and fishing and fishermen in the 1800s used to call the inside of the silkworm, silkworm gut. So when Nick says they used gut to fish, it may have been referring to silkworm gut. Those had to be imported from Italy. That would have been fairly expensive for uh, an ordinary fisherman. Uh, 
sheep gut would have been uh, cheaper. Pete, I haven't haven't heard you say much about um, the story that for me is the most complex in the in the ones that are assigned for tonight, and that's the story called "A Way You'll Never Be." Um, mm -hmm. What what is your what is your take on that story? I, I it's very problematic for me, uh, and so uh, I'm just wondering what 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 are your insights into that story that. For those of us who've just read it once or twice and, and are at least slightly puzzled by it, uh, would benefit from? Presumably the title was Hemingway's gift to Jane Mason, who was in a mental hospital in New York. And uh, he titled the story, you know, you're not as bad as uh, this character of mine, implying again, to the extent that it may have been autobiographical, as bad as I was after my wounding. Not that we have any evidence of anything like that in Hemingway's case. Um, here we have problems with the iceberg. Uh, everybody knows that Nick is in bad mental problems and Nick himself says, I could feel it coming on. And Paravicini sees something in Nick. It's not simply Nick's talkativeness. Um, but what he sees, we're not told. Um, so some manifestation of hysterics, but what we don't know. And, uh, you know, that leaves us guessing, unfortunately. All right, so Nick advances across, leaves his bicycle, um, advances across from Fornaci to the banks of the Piava. Um, he's wearing a uh, presumed American uniform uh, to show off to the Italian troops. By the way, uh, New York's mayor at the time, Fiorello LaGuardia, also because he spoke Italian, was dressed in an, a, uh, an American uniform and sent to Italy to show off an American uniform. Wow. Um, the... Um, whole discourse about locusts, uh, of course, he talks about the medium brown locust as being the best bait. Well, uh, what has descended upon Europe are hordes of brown dressed soldiers, a plague of locusts, destroying the land, destroying crops, destroying people, equally brown dressed, most of them khaki. And um, the uh, connotations of the biblical plagues and the modern swarms of okay, soldiers baby. are, uh, I, I, I think, are quite close and definite. Um, that uh, obviously that uh, Italian officers should carry a uh, sane of uh, silk netting in order to capture locusts, in order to go fishing, is of course absurd. Uh, obviously, it's a sign of Nick's mental problems. Yeah. I think it's also Hemingway's comment on the, uh, the way the war was being handled, which I think in his estimation uh, was equally insane. Um, so we have a few more comments in the chat. Um, oh, now my, I'm getting the wheel of death on my screen, so I'm not touching anything until it goes away. Um, okay, there we go. Uh, William has asked, who do you think the you in a way you'll never be most likely refers to? Is it more than just the reader or those who haven't experienced combat? 
Well, I think, as I said, I think it was directed to Jane Mason. Um, there is a connection, however, if you think back to the Battler, where uh, Bugs, I'm uh, sorry, Ad says to Bugs, he's never been crazy, says he's never been crazy. And uh, Bugs says he's got a lot coming to him. Well, here it's come to him. Uh, we see him manifesting uh, aspects of irrationality. Uh, it could be directed, I mean, beyond Jane, certainly it could be directed at the general audience. Okay. Um, okay, there's uh, just a, another question about the yellow house. Um, you had mentioned you thought that was in relation to death. Yes. And uh, Nick is dreams of it and is afraid of it. And of, cur of course, we've seen Nick's concerns about death in the past in other stories. Yes. Uh, the beginning of that story in particular, well, uh, sorry, in, uh, that's in um, uh, Where You'll Never Be, it's in Now I Lay Me, uh, his fear of death, his fear of uh, dropping off uh, at night and his soul leaving his body. It's interesting to note, you know, obviously, at, when he's younger in Indian camp, where he's fearing that he will never die. And now he's suddenly, sh well, currently showing the fear because of, of the experiences that he has in, in Italy there. It's, um, even, it's even in, uh, well, and the fragment we have um, crossing, he's afraid of, of climbing on the davits, looking oh, down wow. in the water. And it's in, uh, in another country where he says, the others were hawks and I was not a hawk. Uh, and I did not know how I would be when I went back into war. So yes, um, we talk about, you know, the quote that uh, Burns and Novick used from Hadley, uh, he had so many sides, he uh, defied geometry. Um, he had this macho image that he presented, but yeah, Nick is often afraid. Um, so there is a, a question in the chat um, about why Ernest went to war and why he chose Italy. Well, he went to war because his hero, uh, Teddy Roosevelt went to war, uh, charging up San Juan Hill and uh, uh, young Ernest was going to do everything that uh, Teddy did, including going to Africa and hunting big game. Uh, he had read uh, Crane's Red Badge of Courage. Um, he was he was going to be a hero. Uh, he tried to enlist, and because he had inherited his mother's uh, limited vision, he was denied. Um, uh, he did enlist in the Missouri National Guard, um, but uh, he joined the Red Cross. Now, whether he asked for duty in Italy, probably not. I think simply uh, the uh, Red Cross assigned him to Italy rather than France. Uh, luck of the draw, uh, same way the army assigned me to the infantry, not my choice. Okay, let's see. Oh, Jolie, feel free to jump on in. I know you've got other questions in the chat. I was just going to uh, read them, but they'll come better oh, from you. Actually, I was just going to say I um, I was reading, uh, I don't know how to say his name, Florzik, Flor Florzik, Stephen Flor. He's one of the Hemingway critics who wrote the book about um, 
Hemingway and Dos Passos and the others serving on the ambulance oh, crews, you know, right. Dos Passos and Cummings and all those guys. Anyway, um, at least according to that source and another World War I ambulance book that I was reading the other day, um, what had happened right before Hemingway and Ted Rumbach, his, his friend yes. from the newspaper, whatever his name is, um, before they went to Italy, um, France, now that American troops were, were going to France, they discontinued the volunteer ambulance drivers, uh, little units in France, and the Red Cross apparently in France was, I don't know, being more discerning or something. So they were so they were sending everybody at that point when Ted and and Hemingway went. From what I understand, they were sending folks to Italy specifically, and that part of it was actually was actually propaganda, according to Dos Passos, um, which I I always thought that was just Nick's invention in the story that he was wearing the American mm -hmm. uniform to reassure the troops. But Dos Passos said that they they really were there even when they didn't need ambulance drivers because they were trying to motivate, they were being used as propaganda to motivate the troops. Which yeah, well, as I crazy. No, uh, as I said, uh, it was true about Fiorella LaGuardia as well. So no, that that actually did happen. Uh, all right, so you, you confirm my suspicion. It was done by the Red Cross at, with an ulterior motive. Uh, uh, William has a question. Actually, uh, hi, Peter. It's Bill Blaschek here. Uh, and it's getting late in Liverpool in England, so I, I'm not sure how long I can stay up here. But, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, just to confirm that about the American Red Cross in Italy, they were actually uh, disbanded basically the Red, Red Cross in France uh, in in nineteen late late uh, nineteen seventeen. That's when the, uh, they they were broken up, and uh, so that was only left. The, it, Italy was where they directed their energies then the, the American Red Cross. So that's why he would, have, he would have been sent there. For all those reasons you said, yeah, partly for practical medical reasons, um, but also, um, yeah, to show, well, like it says in um, in the stories, to show that the Americans are, are there to help. Uh, Hemingway was originally assigned to Shio in the uh, Italian Alps. And nothing was happening. I mean, there were, um, first of all, you have to remember that the US was in the war for only about five months. Um, they declared war in uh, the previous year, but had spent the whole year training troops because they disbanded training. And uh, troops only landed in France in April, and the war was over in November. So it was a short war. Uh, Hemingway got there in uh, late May, early June, forget the exact dates. He was sent initially to Shio, and nothing was happening. Um, frostbite occasionally, uh, malaria sometimes. Um, and so he volunteered to go to uh, the Piave River, where there was active fighting. And uh, not as an ambulance driver, but as a canteen volunteer. And their job was to distribute cigarettes, candy, and the little postcards where you check off. It didn't write anything. You simply said, you know, I'm alive, I'm well. Etc. Um, and he crawled ahead of the front lines to a forward listening post. And that's the one that was hit with a mortar shell uh, two weeks before his uh, 19th birthday. So again, he wanted to see the action. 
Um, I think uh, In Love and War with Sandra Bullock and Chris uh, McDonald is a terrible movie. I think the only th thing good about it is when Chris gets over there and he's so excited to play with the rifles. This is exciting for him. These are military rifles. Woohoo! And it's like a little boy playing soldier. I thought that that scene was good. Well, certainly Ernest's interest in being um, in the thick of it in war, I mean, that's that service in the ambulance just wet his appetite for the rest of his life. I mean, he he wanted to be in the thick of it at all times. Well, not in 1942. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, there he resisted uh, Martha's call to, to get involved for two years. Uh, he stayed home until 44. Uh, no, that's that's unfair. Uh, he uh, he went out looking for subs on the Pillar uh, weekly, but in terms of active engagement uh, in a shooting war, no, not for two years, the beginning of the Second World War. Um, we have another question here. Where did it go? Let's see. Have to scroll back up. Okay, Elizabeth asks, uh, what she thinks might be a trivial question regarding grammar does or did Italy have uh, equivalent and I don't speak French so uh, of dictating and anchoring rules of the language thereby underscoring the majors need to hold on to order. I don't know if they had a, a, an academy of language as the French do. Uh, I, I cannot answer that question. I, I simply know that that um, you know prior to uh, God prior even to the fifties, uh, language in most countries was fairly well set. It, it uh, did not change, um, and uh, you know only more recently when we had, for example. Uh, um, R.G. Reynolds and Winston's telling us Winston's tastes good like, as opposed to as a cigarette should, that we had dropped the distinction between like and as. And now with uh, gender fluidity, we can say they is, because that's currently also acceptable grammar. But uh, it's a rapid change, but it wasn't so in Hemingway's day. All right, I think I am caught up on. Oh, there was just a comment from Joan uh, regarding in night before landing, Nick's friend, the tall pole, was going to become a fighter pilot. I think of him as going to England and joining uh, the RAF where many Polish pilots served. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. And there were American pilots also serving in the Lafayette Espadrille in, in France before uh, the, the U.S. officially entered uh, the First World War. So, yes. Um, ah, here we have Elizabeth. She had an answer from her. The French are unusual in having a formal official governmental attitude toward the national language. Yes. All right. All right. Thank do you, we, Nikki. Do we have any other? Oh, Jolie, please. It's it's just two trivia items. One is about the Académie Française. I recently learned that one of the founding members of the Academy um, was uh, a guy named Perot, or it looks like Peralt. I think it's pronounced Perot, but I don't know. Um, who wrote 
the versions of most of the fairy tales that we know now, including Cinderella and mm -hmm. uh, Sleeping Beauty and Little Red Riding Hood and all those. So that's what we know him for now, if we know him at all. But he was he was one of the founding members of the Academy. And I just I found that really just <laughs> kind of delightful. Um, and my other. Uh, and my other, oh, and my other trivia, which talk about not focus. Um, and my other trivia was this, if you wanna hear Jonathan Swift having a conniption about the way that language is changing and he wants to have people strung up for it. Um, this, is, this was my dad's textbook in 1935. It's a history of the La English language by Albert Baugh or Bo, B-A-U-G-H. H, Bo. Yeah, and it's just, it's so much fun. Anyway, so those are my my two little bits of trivia, not to do with Hemingway. Wonderful. All right. Uh, I feel like I wish I could show, uh, I actually got a copy of the DVD of Hemingway's Adventures of a Young Man. I just don't know what the legalities of showing that to a group would be. And we'd have to all commit two and a half hours uh, <laughs> doing it. Um, but I did buy it and watched it on a cold, snowy day this past winter. Um, and might uh, put it in the DVD player again sometime this weekend as well. Well, there is that scene, as I said, with the uh, buyer standing in front of uh, Ricardo Montalban um, and saying no he doesn't speak italian and having an orderly assigned to him all right any other final questions or comments so i wanted have to share seen, oh go ahead have you seen george coburn's young hemingway uh documentary yes i did i thought it was really good i thought he mm -hmm. did an excellent job um uh, Charlotte, if you want to ask your question, then I'll answer the one in the chat. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Unusual for Charlotte. Now I got it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> My uh, keypad is not very reliable. I I just wanted to say that, the, you know, um, the part about Hemingway's vision being inherited from his mother was just one more, you know, untrue thing that he said about his parents, because uh -huh. her, her poor vision was not inheritable. It was a result of scarlet fever. She had perfect vision before she had scarlet fever as a child, and she was totally blind for some months. And then she, her vision never fully recovered, but that's, um, uh, and I talked to his sister about it and the uh, interview with Sunny that I mentioned, I think she said that too. Okay. And isn't that why she had to quit doing the stage shows because the lights bothered her so bad. Yeah, it, was very, it was very troublesome. Thank you, Charlotte. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a question to me in the chat regarding the uh, finale event, the caravan tour in May, and that is going to take place on Thursday, May 13th. And we will be gathering in um, in Melrose Township Park next to the Hemingway Historical Marker in Walloon Lake at five o'clock. And we will be uh, driving our individual cars in a caravan. Uh, we will be going out uh, to Horton Bay, to Sumner Road, um, to the Nick Adams Preserve. And then we will be coming back to Walloon Lake where the Walloon Lake Inn will be offering a Hemingway happy hour uh, featuring, I believe, a cocktail with the Pilar rum. Uh, perhaps um, there at the hotel, and uh, so we will we'll be doing that. And folks can can uh, drive with friends, or and it doesn't. I mean, it can, that is kind of open to anybody that's in the area, even if they haven't um, necessarily been participating in all of the discussions the last few weeks. Um, before I go into the waiting assignment for next week, I wanted to share. I shared it with a few of us at the beginning. But last Saturday, we had it declared Ernest Hemingway Day in Michigan, and the governor and lieutenant governor signed this special tribute uh, on the anniversary of the publishing of the Nick Adams story. 
And so that was a, a pretty big deal uh, for us to get this recognition. Uh, you know, I think I've mentioned it before when you ask people and in some of the Hemingway groups I'm in on Facebook, you ask people to say, name a location in the world that has ties to Hemingway and rarely do people mention Walden Lake or Northern Michigan. And so we worked uh, with the village of Walden Lake and the Michigan Hemingway Society of Chris Struble to uh, to get this proclamation in place. So it was kind of a kind of a nice uh, thing. And I'm supposed to be getting an actual um, copy of this certificate in the mail. And hopefully it'll arrive before next Wednesday. And if it does, I'll be presenting it to the, um, the Town Development Authority for Walloon Lake Village. And hopefully they'll hang it in the town hall. So we're pretty excited about all of that. Um, so for next week, section four, you have a, a lighter reading assignment in some regards, fewer section, fewer chapters, but probably the longest stories. Uh, so we have the big two-hearted two river, the end of something, the three-day blow, and summer people. And Jennifer Cannon will be our moderator. Jen is on the board of the Michigan Hemingway Society. She is a teacher at West Bloomfield High School and is the creator of the Literary Garden, um, which takes uh, plantings from authors all over the country and they planted them in this garden in the um, courtyard at their school and among the things growing there is mint from Horton Bay and I think that was actually one of the first uh, things that she had uh, planted uh, in there and so she will be running uh, that discussion and um, I think Catherine Palmer is still with us and she'll be leading our final discussion on um, May, uh, May 6th for the last section of the book. So we are halfway, we're more than halfway through now. And I've been very excited to see the turnout and appreciate everyone who has offered up comments or questions, particularly our uh, moderators. Uh, Peter, if you would please send me your mailing address. I have a, a thank you gift to send out to you. Don, yours went in the mail today, so please look for that. And uh, of course, Catherine, I'll probably hand deliver yours to you uh, when we meet somewhere for a drink. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, since, we're, since we're local and all. Um, but I do thank everyone for committing yet another evening to this event and um, looking forward to seeing everybody next week. And uh, um, Julia, please. Quick question. I didn't sign up for next week and the week after because it's finals and I wasn't sure I would have time with grading papers, but I'm going to make time anyway if it's not too late. Am I too late nope. to sign up? You know, you can even sign up after we start the event. So the registration okay. stays open and it sends an automatic link. Uh, so anyone can join and we are recording. So uh, I think I, I had some issues with the recording last week. That's why I didn't send a follow up. It somehow got lost in cyberspace and I had to email Zoom to find out where it was. Uh, but they did return it to me finally. And um, so I probably will do a follow up email uh, to everybody that's been involved in at least one section and share those links toward the end as well. So and we've been having people follow us along on Facebook Live. And it's just been um, a really great uh, response. Um, and I just love that we have people, we were international tonight, which was mm -hmm. great. So uh, thank you all again. Hope to see you all here in the next two weeks. And perhaps some of you here on uh, May 13th as we take our caravan tour as well. So thank you all again. Funny to see how fast everybody drops off. <laughs>